Now let's talk about some protocols that involve changing the chemistry of your mouth, not just immediately after meals or during brushing or flossing, but really around the clock. And one of the key protocols that I'd like to discuss is the use of an artificial sugar called xylitol. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Mo and I'm a licensed dentist. Today I'll be critiquing neuroscientist Dr. Huberman on his claims in relation to xylitol. Xylitol is a very low calorie sweetener. I can place it among the other low calorie sweeteners like aspartame, sucralose, stevia, etc. But what's unique about xylitol is that very much like standard sugar or any kind of carbohydrate sugar, the bacteria Streptococcus mutans loves to eat xylitol. But when Streptococcus mutans eats xylitol, it doesn't meaning it cannot produce the acid that normally would demineralize the teeth and create cavities. In addition to that, when Streptococcus mutans eats xylitol, it kills Streptococcus mutans. So what this means is that if... So studies have shown that uh, on, like, on the consumption of xylitol, that would reduce not only the, the acids that are um, byproduct uh, coming from these bacteria mentioned, the streptococcus mutants, but also it there's the reduction in the growth in the presence of streptococcus mutants. Xylitol is present in the oral cavity after a meal, say in the minutes and hours after a meal. Then any strep mutans that happens to be there is going to preferentially feed on the xylitol, not other sugars and it won't be able to release acid. And because xylitol can actually inhibit the growth, and that is the yeah. proliferation of more strep mutans, we've got a twofer. We've got a situation where strep mutans can't release acid to demineralize the teeth and potentially cause cavities. And the total amount of strep mutans that can grow, that can proliferate in what are called colonies, literally the bacteria colonizes on the teeth in that forming that biofilm, well then that can't happen. So xylitol is a very potent tool for improving oral health in this way. So this is just a lot of jargon to say that xylitol, like I'll just give you a summary, it will reduce the acidity in the mouth that's coming from the wastes of these bacteria and it would reduce uh, their growth. It's just, I'm just like <laughs> dumbing it down in summary. In addition, xylitol reduces inflammation of the gum tissue and other soft tissues of the mouth. And so xylitol is providing an array of positive benefits, especially when it's present in the mouth immediately after meals. And for that reason, there are a number of different dentists that have created xylitol products in the form of gums or in the form of mints, specifically to be used after meals. So by chewing a few of these xylitol mints or by chewing a xylitol based gum immediately after a meal, you're taking substantial steps towards improving the chemical milieu of your mouth and inhibiting the proliferation of cavity forming streptococcus mutants. Now you so one of the most common forms of xylitol that a patient or a person who is interested in the benefits of xylitol is in a form of a chewing gum. And actually, uh, this is a great way to have xylitol in your mouth because you're gonna go and chew the gum over a some long period of time. Now, why is this important? Why did I specifically note out this chewing example in the gum? Because during chewing also, you're going to stimulate the release of saliva. Saliva itself also has a huge whole realm of benefits for your mouth and for the protection for preventative purposes of your teeth. And it's just a few examples are saliva helps in neutralizing the pH of your teeth. So let's say if uh, the pH was slightly acidic, the saliva will help, it will aid in neutralizing that pH. Other than this, how does it have preventative benefits to your teeth is that it also has fluoride. Fluoride uh, is in your saliva and it's very important in helping 
preventing uh, your teeth from not only preventing your teeth from cavities but also if there is a like a cavity or rather to be more specific like caries at the very initial incipient stage then the fluoride will also help aid in the remineralization right okay you can also find some literature on other proposed benefits of xylitol such as you know, improving overall microbiome, uh, such as reducing inflammation in other tissues besides the gums and within the mouth. There is some evidence that it can support the gut microbiome because of course the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome are contiguous. They have different compartments. I mean, you might even be surprised to learn that within your mouth, there are different niches as they're called. For instance, there's different microbiota that live on the gums versus the hard palate versus the soft palate back in the throat. And then as you descend into the gut, et cetera, and it does appear that xylitol has certain positive benefits for all of those different gut microbiome niches. But the literature on that is less well substantiated than, for instance, the literature showing that if xylitol is put in as a surrogate sugar substrate for strep mutans, that it disables strep mutans and can prevent the formation of cavities. Now, as far as I know, when... So hats off to Dr. Huberman in clarifying and clearly stating that there is a much stronger evidence in relation to xylitol and the health benefits rather the oral health uh, benefits versus you know whatever he mentioned about the gut and oral microbiome i mean i would argue it's a bit outside my expertise is that we need to still learn a lot more about the gut microbiome the importance of the gut microbiome and with regard to the oral cavity in the mouth going back to my specialty well it's the first a part of your digestive system, right? This is where the food enters and the process starts. So it, it of course, it is connected and linked with the rest of, of your digestive system. So it makes sense. When consumed in mint form or gum form, I'm not aware of any specific side effects or bad effects of xylitol, provided that it's not consumed in excess. But as with everything, dosage matters. So, so I disagree with this uh, and because uh, I don't know if he will mention this later because first time I'm watching this video and that is uh, there are patients, okay, there's percentage of patients that are allergic to xylitol and they may have an exaggerated allergic response on the uh, ingestion of xylitol. If you're somebody who wants to explore the use of xylitol gum or xylitol mints after a meal, I wouldn't suggest going from consuming zero xylitol mints to consuming 50 a day or something like that, or even 10 a day. You might start off slowly and just consume one or two after a meal, maybe just your morning meal, maybe just your evening meal, something of that sort, rather than chewing xylitol gum all day long, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just mention one other positive benefit of xylitol gum, which is if you use xylitol gum after say your noon meal or your early day meal, it further increases the production of saliva, which as we talked about before is a great thing because one of the best ways to support oral health and tooth health is to have a long stretch of time in the middle of the day where you're producing a lot of healthy saliva in large amounts because again, saliva is this incredible stuff that's supporting remineralization of the teeth. So lot so note that term, remineralization of the teeth. If you remember at the beginning of the video, we discussed uh, the remineralization how, how, and how saliva is involved and what are the components in the saliva that aid in the process of remineralization. Remineralization is extremely important uh, because it would prevent that progression of the caries from a very incipient initial stage, the very advanced stage where you need a dense intervention, when you, where you need my intervention. <laughs> Lots and lots of reasons to think about, maybe consider using xylitol gum or xylitol mints. There are a number of different ones available out there. I have zero, again, zero financial relationship to any of those mint or gum companies. I'll provide a link in the show note captions to one source. The company and the products were developed by a dentist, Dr. Ellie Phillips, who is quite prominent in the public health education space around dental health. Some of her views are a little bit controversial, like her views on flossing. Other of her views, I find, frankly, quite ahead of their time in that she's been talking about a number of these things, like promoting the health of the oral microbiome and the potential value of xylitol gums and mints, et cetera, for some period of time. I think 
most of the information that she puts out there is supported by other dentists and she still suggests regular dental visits. So um, you know nothing renegade out there or heretical. Uh, again, there are other sources of xylitol gums and mints that you could consider. I'm just simply putting a link to the one that I use because I happen to use them and like them. So I'd like to use the discussion about xylitol as a segue into a discussion about toothpaste. So, man, I mean, he clearly stated there's no financial involvement, but that was a decent, I guess, uh, he claims unpaid advertisement. <laughs> because there is a lot of controversy out there about which toothpaste are better for us, maybe even bad for us and best for us. I think it's fair to say, based on what we all now know about xylitol, that if you can find a toothpaste that contains xylitol as a sweetener, that can only be a good thing. And indeed, there are a number of them out there. We'll talk about specific sources in a little bit, but let's just put xylitol on the um, short to not so short list of things that would be great to have in a toothpaste for all the reasons that you now understand. The real big question with toothpaste is always, should I use a toothpaste that has fluoride or avoid toothpaste that have fluoride? And in Let's see what he has to say about it. There's a whole anti-fluoride army. I discussed this extensively and based on scientific evidence, what I've come across, unless if you have an allergy to fluoride, which is a, from my understanding, like a minuscule or rather, let's just say a small percent, very small percentage of people have uh, if you had a history of any problems with using fluoride, if you do not, like, if you're not uh, mis misusing a fluoride in a wrong way or, or uh, something like this, like, if you're not using the fluoride in a wrong way, if you're not ingesting it, if you don't have an allergy, then it should be generally fine. Again, it's not medical advice. Go see your uh, dental and healthcare professional, but this I'm just saying what's based on research. Let's see what he has to say. In order to answer that, we have to go back to our earlier discussion about fluoride. It really depends on whether or not you're somebody that thinks that fluoride is great because it creates these super physiologically strong bonds within our teeth. The crystal structures are that much stronger than when formed by hydroxyapatite, or whether or not you're somebody who is wary of fluoride, that you're concerned about potential brain health issues or thyroid issues and you know here i think people so he mentions hydroxyapatite so this is the structure uh, that is present on your teeth now if my memory <laughs> does not fail me uh, after the use of a fluoride or their in topical form or whatever when fluoride is in, in fault they uh, like there would be structures of fluoroapatite, right? And just read about the benefits and how different are they and how more karyoresistant, meaning more resistant to caries the teeth become when they have the, such structures or particles. People really do fall into either camp or the camp, frankly, of, I don't know, should I be worried? I don't know if I should be worried. Yeah. I personally grew up using fluoride toothpaste. Okay? We had the kind of standard name brand fluoride toothpaste. Um, in our bathroom. I brushed my teeth with those for years. Whether or not that negatively impacted my health or not, I don't know. Uh, get my blood work done. My thyroid hormones are normal. Um, my brain well, works at least you know reasonably well. But I do realize that some people are very concerned about fluoride and they just don't want it anywhere near their kids. They don't want it anywhere near themselves. So if you're somebody who's going to err on the side of caution with fluoride and you are seeking a non-fluoride containing toothpaste, there are such toothpastes out there. And most of those, if not all of them, contain, you guessed it, hydroxyapatite. They contain the minerals that naturally form the bonds that create that additional enamel that can potentially fill in cavities and by remineralization of the enamel and some of the deeper layers of the tooth. So if one is seeking toothpaste and you want to avoid fluoride, you'd want to find something that ideally had hydroxyapatite and something that had xylitol. And they often also contain some sort of mild abrasive, okay, not a, not a really scratchy abrasive substance, um, but a mild abrasive that can really allow for breaking up of the biofilm that we talked about earlier. Now I've provided links to a couple of sources for such toothpaste and also for uh, these little toothpaste tablets um, that I've been using lately as well. I sometimes switch back and forth between the two. These are tablets that you chew up and then you uh, brush your teeth immediately after you, with your wet toothbrush. Both of them work quite well. 
um, that I've been using lately as well. I sometimes switch back and forth between the two. These are tablets that you blitz links to a couple of sources for such toothpaste and also for uh, these little toothpaste tablets um, that I've been using lately as well. I sometimes switch back and forth between the two. These are tablets that you chew up and then you uh, brush your teeth immediately after you, with your wet toothbrush. So uh, I assume he's talking, if I'm not wrong, he's talking about the tablets that uh, that are like, uh, would show you where is uh, plaque present even after you brush your teeth. Sometimes there's still uh, remaining plaque in certain areas so that you could clean your teeth again and be specific to those uh, areas. Um, so these are the tablets he, he didn't say. Both of them work quite well. Again, I want to be clear that the companies that I've provided links to in the show note captions are companies for which I have absolutely zero financial relationship. I do know some of the people that started these companies. I actually discovered these companies because these people are dentists or periodontists. So they're called plaque disclosing tablets. I just looked at this or other people in the oral health field. Uh, but I also want to be very clear that there was no exchange of promotion of their products for information or otherwise. I simply tried and liked the products and I just so happen anything. I do believe these are quality sources. These are the toothpaste and tooth tablets that I happen to use, gums and mints that I happen to use and some other things to promote oral health. And I'm sure there are other sources that you feel. Okay, so the rest is just rambling about how he's not financially involved. Thank you, everyone, uh, very much for watching. Dr. Modens here, out.